start. Um, hi everyone and welcome to the Designing for People Research Clusters uh, second seminar of the fall term. I'm Jocelyn and I'm the research facilitator for DFP. Uh, a quick heads up that we are recording this session and as always it will be posted to our YouTube channel for those who are unable to join us live. If you have any privacy concerns please feel free to contact me after the seminar. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that DFP's offices and classrooms are located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. For those unfamiliar with this terminology, traditional recognizes lands traditionally used and or occupied by the Musqueam people or other First Nations in other parts of the country. Ancestral recognizes land that is handed down from generation to generation. Unceded refers to land that was not turned over to the Crown by a treaty or other agreement. Um, and I encourage you to use the links below to learn more. Uh, a couple of quick announcements before we begin. Um, our next seminar is on November 18th with Professor and DFP co-director Karen McLean giving a talk on emotional robots and magical objects. There's also a seminar on December 9th with four of our core DFP faculty where they'll be giving updates on their DFP funded stimulus projects. Finally, the October DFP newsletter is out. Um, I encourage you to download it from our website and take a look. There's lots going on, including new members joining the team. All DFP newsletters are posted on our website under the news and events calendar and newsletter section. So at this point, I will pass things over to our new Seminar Steering Committee Chair, Professor Don Wokyun. Thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, hi, I am Don Wook from Computer Science. I'm an assistant professor there, has been uh, there for three years uh, since 2017. Uh, I am honored to introduce uh, Professor Juho Kim today uh, for this seminar. Um, Juho Kim is an associate professor at School of Computing in Kaist, Daejeon, Korea, South Korea. And uh, he is one of the most prominent figures in HCI, crowdsourcing, and social computing. Um, he's most well known for uh, suggesting the notion of learner sourcing in his PhD thesis when he graduated from MIT CSAIL uh, four years ago, uh, if I'm correct. And, and um, it has generated many uh, subsequent studies that, that extended those concepts um, by connecting what learners can do in the learning system and then collecting those uh, data-driven uh, features to enhance the learner's experience and, and their learning. Um, he's, uh, Juho is involved in CHI, CSCW, Learning at Scale, and IUI. Um, the, the usual suspect in the uh, HCI uh, venues in general. And uh, he has been extending his research to embrace human-centered AI theme. And he will also serve as a committee member at uh, IIII in 2021. Um, he will talk about designing AI-powered interactive systems for learning, analytics, and discussion. So the theme it will be about human AI interaction, I believe, uh, but with uh, applications to the learning analytics and discussion, uh, social computing uh, in general. So um, I believe the talk will be very relevant to our audiences who are uh, mostly from the two joint uh, groups. One from the designing for people uh, audiences where they're uh, doing mostly design centric research. Uh, and also technology-based uh, design. And, and also Kaida um, group, uh, we, we also cross-listed our uh, this talk to Kaida, uh, obviously for the uh, theme of the talk. So um, no, no further ado, I think uh, we are ready to start and then I'm gonna turn the microphone to Juho. Thank you, Dongu, for the great introduction. Uh, can everyone uh, hear me okay? I see some nods. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you for the great introduction and also uh, inviting me to this uh, wonderful venue. Uh, Designing for People, I think, is a great name. Um, and I'm really uh, excited to talk about uh, some of the ongoing research uh, that I've been working on. Uh, with regards to designing interactive systems uh, with AI technology. Um, and the two takeaway messages that I want to um, um, deliver today are that 
first, we should be thinking more about uh, human AI interaction when talking about and working with AI technology. And the second message is um, that there are these design lessons that could be learned from working on these, um, you know, designing interactive systems using AI. Um, and I'm going to highlight some of the um, aspects that might be relevant to uh, what many people have, have been thinking about in this field. And especially because of the domains of my work are about learning, analytics, and discussion, uh, you might be noticing that these are highly complex and, and demanding tasks um, to support with AI technology. So I'm going to uh, share some of these um, uh, honest uh, design reflections and lessons uh, with the hope that you could uh, um, you know, learn something uh, from my experience as well. So my understanding is that this audience is perhaps a mix of more design or HCI oriented uh, background and also AI oriented uh, people. So with that uh, in mind, uh, please feel free to um, you know, ask any questions in the middle and I'd be happy to answer at least uh, more of the clarification and factual questions and maybe defer some of the uh, longer discussion type questions to the end so that we can have more time um, to talk about those. Great. Um, so I'm going to start off with this quote. I'm sure many of you have probably seen this uh, over Twitter, maybe. Um, so this is uh, Jeff Bigan from CMU, um, who said, uh, the two hardest problems in computer science are first, people. Second, convincing computer scientists that the hardest problem in computer science is people. And three, off by one errors. So the last one is more of a joke. Um, but I think this is more about uh, self-reflection as computer scientists uh, that we perhaps have not been uh, thinking too hard about people when we design these technologies. Um, so I think when we think about what is the goal of computer science, I think one possible definition is that computer science is about making computers that are better in some aspect. And I think each sub area in computer science could be seen as defining their own notion of what better means. So it could be faster, more secure, more intelligent, more maintainable, more reliable, modular kind of computer. Um, and in uh, human computer interaction, I would argue that uh, uh, the entire field could be seen as an effort to make computers that are more useful and usable for people. And often the uh, core sort of uh, unit of analysis and design uh, for HCI is interaction, where we tend to focus on designing and building or understanding uh, how people interact with computers. But then um, human computer interaction is uh, great and has been around for a while. Then how are computers and AI different in that now we're talking more about human AI interaction. Is it similar to HCI or same as HCI or is it completely different? So I think that's an interesting question that uh, you know really merits some discussion. And obviously a lot of people or pretty much everyone is talking about AI these days. Um, so these uh, stats have been uh, posted literally yesterday about the NeurIPS uh, conference. The, uh, one of the major uh, machine learning conferences, AI conferences. So they are getting almost 10,000 submissions um, now, uh, and they've been accepting uh, almost 2,000 papers uh, this year. So just the sheer size of how uh, AI as a field has grown is quite remarkable. Um, while everyone is you know, excited about AI and doing a lot of research in AI, uh, in HCI, uh, people have also been talking about AI and humans at the same time. So, um, you know, there are many of these calls of, in companies that are now looking for people who are working at the intersection of human factors and machine learning. Um, so this was a, a position in Apple and, you know, my sort of prediction uh, was that we're going to see more and more uh, positions like this. Uh, as more companies are trying to use AI in their products, we will need more people who work at the intersection of AI and uh, UI UX design. And there are people writing great papers about humans and AI together. And uh, Ben Schneiderman, who said he'll be in the audience, and I think he might be in the audience, um, uh, I, I learned about this exciting new paper that has come out literally last week 
uh, where he uh, sort of puts together his uh, latest thoughts on human-centered uh, AI. And these guideline papers have already uh, been getting a lot of traction uh, from both researchers and trick practitioners. Guidelines for human interaction, human AI interaction. This is from Microsoft Research. And Google has also um, published this uh, website with people and AI guidebook. And there are lots of courses uh, people are creating um, to cover this exciting new topic. And I have been doing uh, my share uh, in this space as well. Um, so I am teaching this course on human AI interactions. You can actually uh, you know, check uh, the syllabus and what we've been doing in this class by visiting this website. Um, and the uh, ACM has this interactions magazine. Um, and we started this new forum called uh, UX Meets AI. Um, and I'm a co-editor uh, with Henriette Kramer from uh, Spotify, uh, where we want to uh, create this uh, forum of you know, people talking and sharing their design lessons and uh, some of the considerations when it comes to thinking about uh, UX of AI. So if you have uh, you know, exciting work that you've been doing in this space or thought pieces are uh, also welcome, please uh, let, us, let us know and we can talk about um, uh, you know, inviting you as, a, as an author uh, for this um, uh, forum. So uh, going back to this question of you know, human computer interaction and human AI interaction, uh, what's all the buzz about human AI interaction? Um, is computer and AI actually different? Um, so it's actually you know, crowdsourced um, ideas from students in my class because I asked the same question to my students, trying to get a sense of how students are thinking about AI when they hear about this term. Um, so these are some of the uh, key um, ideas uh, that came out. Um, AI uh, has this uh, technical uh, characteristics of being more probabilistic and statistical, which makes it somewhat hard to predict. It doesn't always give the same results to people. Uh, that might uh, you know, raise some issues in terms of consistency when it comes to uh, you know, UI design. Um, they also tend to be somewhat autonomous and they can be adaptive and adaptable, uh, which can be different from more static uh, type of uh, interfaces. And the, the way they are perceived by people um, is also relevant. Uh, a lot of people um, you know, use AI to um, sort of describe how things can be more accurate um, and can be achieved uh, with lower cost, with higher efficiency. And many people think it's objective. But at the same time, there's a lot of discussion about how AI could be biased. So it's interesting how you know both sort of somewhat conflicting uh, values uh, have been um, discussed uh, about AI, and they are also human-like because the, the term of uh, artificial intelligence uh, seems to suggest that we can create human-like intelligence with um, technology, um, and sometimes uh, they can replace or doesn't involve humans at all. And sometimes they could be scary and could be hyped. So a lot of these characteristics of AI, I think, uh, could be relevant when we think about um, human AI interaction and design insights. And in our everyday lives, uh, we are interacting with AI quite extensively, whether we uh, you know, uh, recognize them or not. So the social media, like Facebook, uh, is heavily moderated by AI. Um, in their newsfeed algorithms. So these algorithms decide what gets to the top of our feed, what gets shown, not shown. And services like Uber, interestingly, uh, can sometimes serve as a manager for these drivers. And this is somewhat contrast to what we uh, have been thinking in terms of you know, self-driving cars, where humans tell the uh, cars where to go and the cars would bring us there. Um, but in reality, what we're seeing is somewhat of the converse, where uh, the, the computer manager, AI manager, kind of tells the driver where to pick up the passenger and drop them at, at, at what fare, um, and the human is still driving. And as we've seen from you know, 
uh, AI like Deep Blue or AlphaGo, uh, humans and computers are competing in, uh, in the same game, uh, being applied the same type of rules. And when it comes to more high stakes decisions, uh, AI is being more actively used. Uh, for example, in the US court, the Compass algorithm has been used to determine if this person uh, should be jailed or allowed out. And obviously there's a lot of uh, potential room for bias uh, kicking in here. And I'm going to briefly show uh, this video. Um, these are Hong Kong protesters. Uh, I'm not talking about politics uh, today, but uh, please focus on what these protesters are doing. Uh, you know, instead of uh, you know, showing pickets or throwing rocks, uh, they are using laser pointers. Um, and obviously they are uh, pointing at the cameras uh, to block the facial recognition AI because the poli police might be using um, this AI to determine who has participated uh, in the protest and identify them. So this is a really like a 21st century type of cyber war uh, where people are directly almost uh, fighting against the AI. The humans are trying to break uh, how uh, the AI works. Um, and I want to sort of uh, you know, summarize uh, what I've been saying so far in sort of three troubling trends in how AI is portrayed uh, by media and in, in our sort of general perception. Because I think it's relevant to uh, thinking more about what kind of design insights we need and, and what are the you know, next steps uh, in thinking about human AI interaction. So the first uh, troubling trend is that humans are often hidden behind AI. So what I mean by that is when uh, you know, these companies and technologies talk about how things could be automatically done, uh, it's not actually fully automated. And to make it actually work, a lot of human effort goes uh, into it, but a lot of that gets somewhat ignored uh, for various reasons. So um, many of you probably know this uh, ImageNet data set. It's a bedrock for a lot of uh, computer vision, uh, AI research. Um, it's over 10 million uh, images uh, that are categorized into tens of, um, tens of thousands of different categories. So you can find hundreds of images for a very specific type of uh, object, um, like volcano and things like that. And of course, uh, these uh, data sets have been constructed by humans um, so that these algorithms can learn to um, recognize objects and, and, and predict uh, what objects exist in a new image. So often crowdsourcing has been used to create these large scale data sets that have been powering a lot of the AI technology. Um, crowd uh, is involved in collecting, cleaning, processing, labeling, and verifying these types of data sets. And this really interesting book, which I you know, highly, highly recommend uh, by Mary Gray and Sitsuri um, called Ghost Work has been documenting how, you know, there's this hidden work uh, done by humans uh, to make AI work in terms of generating training data, flagging bad content, or fixing errors of AI. And we know that there are hundreds and even thousands of contract workers in those big tech companies that are mostly doing this type of work full time. And uh, the book says almost 8% of Americans have contributed to ghost economy where they have been working uh, in this kind of tasks. And the second troubling trend that I want to point out is the social cost of AI. Here, uh, I want to bring attention to uh, not the, the technical part of AI, but there could be these associated uh, social implications and cost. And uh, this is a well-known example where a smart technology like Google Photos can uh, intelligently identify um, you know, objects in, in photos. So when I type in river in Google Photos app, I get this river looking uh, photos, which are fairly accurate. I mean, some of them are not really river technically, um, but they're, they're really useful. But on the other hand, as you see on the right, there's this uh, terrible, terrible example of identifying black people as gorillas and who's responsible for this kind of technology and how to avoid uh, uh, this kind of uh, critical errors in these systems. Uh, fighting against the racial um, bias 
these are all very, very important topics that need to be addressed. Um, similar for recommender systems. Um, so I, as you could probably see, this is uh, from my YouTube uh, recommendations and I have these small kids, uh, you know, four, year, uh, four year old and one year old and I've been showing a lot of these um, kid videos um, and these are the recommendations that I get. Um, on the other hand, there is the danger of you know, trapped, being trapped in filter bubbles where the idea is that as these algorithms are trying to reinforce uh, more and more of the content that you're likely to be engaged in, uh, there's a danger that you might be you know, trapped inside these uh, small bubbles where it's only about the content that is similar to you um, with viewpoints that are pretty much homogeneous. So with all that, there's been attention to uh, algorithmic auditing and people have been even uh, somewhat jokingly uh, thinking about how uh, similar to how we have organic uh, food, uh, there could be organic technology that does not involve any AI at all. Um, so in that sense, it might even be charged uh, higher than the technology that uses AI because it involves uh, more like human manual labor in it. And the third uh, troubling trend that I want to point out is how we're talking about humans and AI as some uh, you know, competing entities. We see these types of headlines every day, you know, how you know, DeepMind AI uh, compete, uh, competes against humans, beats humans in games, beats doctors, beats lawyers, beats us in everything. And of course, we uh, saw similar cases in very narrowly scoped uh, rule-based systems um, like uh, Go and chess. And we always get this kind of imagery where the, the human champion gets bitten by the, the state-of-the-art AI and they go like this in distress and people are somewhat scared of what's upcoming. But interestingly, um, you know, in, in terms of chess, so we can learn a lot by looking at how chess has uh, been uh, progressing ever since AI kind of, you know, dominated. Um, and there are these new tournaments now where humans and AIs can uh, team up. And what they found is that human alone uh, is of course uh, not that good. Uh, but when the champion teams up with the uh, supercomputer, it's obviously very good. But then, you know, these pretty good players with pretty good computers uh, actually beat uh, those human champion and uh, supercomputer team. So the, the secret sauce behind that was the process. So it wasn't really about the individual um, strength of humans and machines, but rather the process of how the machine and uh, a human work together. So by designing you know, better interaction um, and collaboration between uh, human and machine uh, could actually achieve better outcomes. And this is an uh, example of how uh, this game of advanced uh, chess looks like. So you can see the human player and it has a computer next to them. You can imagine the dynamics of chess uh, would be very different from what we know by involving a computer as a teammate uh, for these humans. And uh, I really like this, uh, you know, two-dimensional view that Ben Schneiderman uh, has suggested uh, in terms of human-centered uh, AI framework. In that a lot of uh, discourse that we have are about how human control and computer automation are in this kind of trade-off relationship, you know, um, in this one-directional view, uh, because it's a, it's a competing relation. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case, is what he argues, and I strongly agree with. Um, when we think about human control and uh, computer automation, it might be possible to achieve a high level in both. So we want to uh, move uh, forward this um, top right uh, quadrant, where it's uh, reliable, safe, and trustworthy technology. And a lot of the, the work that I'm doing at the moment, I would say that the goal of the uh, research that I'm doing these days is really trying to figure out how to move uh, you know, some of the existing uh, technology and the work that we're doing that are often in the you know, bottom right or 
uh, top left corner um, to move them more towards uh, top right, where it's uh, achieving uh, even better uh, human control with uh, more uh, computer automation. So with that kind of uh, background, uh, I want to briefly cover uh, three projects that I've been working on in the space of uh, human AI interaction uh, for the past few years. So these are in the domains of uh, online education and uh, cooking analytics and online discussion. So there are you know, very different uh, domains, but one of the uh, common properties um, that you might notice in these uh, three different domains um, is that you know, they are highly complex. Uh, they are um, somewhat social in nature, and also it involves uh, the human to kind of uh, achieve somewhat of a creative goal um, by themselves. So I wanna uh, first off uh, start by talking about online education uh, in terms of video learning. So I'm sure you've uh, all watched these how-to videos that you know, teach us how to cook something, apply some Photoshop filters, uh, assemble furniture, learn about mathematics. And when you watch those how-to videos, you might have uh, struggled to find specific information, or repeat certain information, or skip the parts that you already know because there isn't much uh, information, the semantic information about the video that's exposed to you as a viewer. So we were thinking if we could have somewhat of a video outline like this, as you see on the left, uh, table of contents type of information, it'd be really useful to help people better understand what's in the video and um, you know, can navigate the video much better. But getting this information could be challenging because even with the state-of-the-art AI, um, it doesn't really give us the highly, highly accurate uh, information like this. So we thought maybe we could turn to people uh, to provide some of the information at least. So we created this website and this is how it works. It's fast forwarded, but you can uh, get the sense of how it works. So once in a while, as the learner watches a video, it pauses and asks you to answer certain questions like, uh, can you summarize the part that you just watched in one line? Or can you, you know, pick the best description of what the video was about? So people can contribute uh, new summary labels or they can vote on the existing uh, uh, options. So what happens here is that uh, learners are prompted to summarize. The system coordinates uh, these tasks uh, to finalize the set of high quality uh, summary labels. And then the UI uh, then presents this video outline to uh, future learners. And underneath it uh, is this you know, multi-stage learner sourcing workflow because uh, this task is crowdsourced to the learners who are watching videos. So that's why uh, we're calling it learner sourcing. And there are these stages. Um, so in the first stage, uh, learners are asked to summarize the part of the video they watched. And once uh, enough summary labels are collected for that part of the video, then, um, then learners are asked to uh, compare and you know, pick uh, the one they think is best. And then there's some final inspection and, and adjustment. So there was a quick summary of this uh, 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 system. Uh, but in terms of evaluation, we wanted to understand if people participating in this kind of uh, effort can get individual benefit while they can also uh, provide useful data to the system. So with this, uh, we ran this uh, experiment with 300 uh, people on Mechanical Turk, a crowdsourcing platform, uh, where we showed people intro to statistics videos, and compared uh, three different interfaces. I'm going to talk about them in the next slide where we measured uh, learning. So uh, the interfaces were first, there's just the baseline and then the um, expert labeled um, summary uh, it's shown. It's meant to be sort of the, the high bar. And then uh, our system um, where we do the prompting and sub goals that are learner sourced uh, gets shown. And the main takeaway is that in terms of retention, uh, you know, how people remember the information they learned a um, few days later, uh, we found out that uh, in, in our system, the crowdy condition, people were remembering, remembering things better 
than people who watch the video only with the baseline interface. And it was comparable to uh, seeing the expert generated labels. So the lesson here is that um, people can um, you know, join in this kind of efforts and at the same time, uh, this system coordinated uh, you know, summarization happens and it actually helps them at the individual level. And in terms of the, the data itself, we did another sort of evaluation where we live deployed the system uh, with 50 uh, videos in web programming and statistics. And we um, did the classroom and also live website deployment where we attracted about a thousand participating users. And when we analyzed some of the most active uh, videos, um, a majority of these learner generated uh, sub goals were rated as matching or even better than expert generated ones when third party raters um, um, evaluated the quality. So in summary, uh, so in this crowdy system, uh, I would argue that uh, there's human interaction, the human AI interaction happening uh, where the humans primarily answer these summary questions and just learn from the video as they would naturally do. And from the AI side, uh, it filters like this uh, high quality summary labels and coordinates learn tasks. And the interaction side, we get the uh, video summary that can help uh, people with video search and navigation. But here, uh, arguably, I mean, there's very little AI involved, uh, to be honest, and also it's not very sophisticated AI. It does very you know, simplistic things of doing like string comparison and deciding uh, uh, you know, whether to keep this or not and that. And here's another project that has sort of uh, more actively um, used more sort of machine learning. So in this project, this is also in the space of online education. Uh, and here we were interested in the problem of problems. Uh, so what I mean is in these uh, online platforms, it's really easy to find a lot of problems to uh, solve because there are many problem banks and you can you know, find this practice exams and so on. But often there aren't that many quality explanations that tell us why, why uh, the answer is uh, X because it's costly to generate a good quality explanations. And sometimes a single best explanation doesn't even exist because different learners might benefit from having different explanations. And there's also an uh, interesting observation that instructors might not actually be best at generating these um, explanations. So we created this interface um, where people are asked to simply you know, answer the question um, so they can solve the problem and submit their answer. So it's a very uh, you know, standard type of um, online learning platform. Uh, and they're shown in an explanation that's picked by the system. And I'm going to tell you later how, how the system picks uh, what kind of explanation to show to the learner. But then they get this additional thing where they are asked to rate how helpful the explanation was and then they're actually given a chance to self-explanation, to, to do a self-explanation by providing their own uh, version of explanation where the, um, it's an educationally proven technique that you know, gets people to think how they came up with, the, uh, with their own solution and it's um, pedagogically useful. But then what happens uh, by the system is that we have this multi-armed bandit uh, formulation so for those of you who are not familiar with the, the technology or the, the, the algorithmic uh, side of it, you can see that there are just multiple versions of things and the system gets to decide uh, probabilistically you know, which one to show, um, which one to pick uh, for the next action. Um, so what this means is that the system needs to repeatedly select an action. So in our case, it would be when a new learner comes to the system, the system needs to decide uh, which explanation to show to the current user. Um, and it needs to learn the effectiveness of actions because when we want to decide an action, we want to have some kind of uh, data or evidence. Um, here, that's why we were asking people to rate the helpfulness of an explanation. 
So the system is now trying to optimize for learners' ratings of uh, this helpfulness. So uh, it's a classic uh, uh, reinforcement learning formulation, if you're familiar, uh, where the core concepts are about exploitation and exploration. So by exploitation, it means it's using the uh, existing information that it has uh, to present effective explanations to the learner. And in terms of exploration, it's about um, um, exp uh, experimenting with these explanations to collect the, the rating data. And then there is the technical Thomson sampling that's used to uh, uh, update the, the policy for uh, deciding you know, which explanation needs to be shown to the next learner. So in a, in a more uh, understandable manner, here's how it works. So each learner contributes an explanation. So when it comes in, it's added as a new arm to the system, as uh, you can remember from the multi-armed uh, the, the octopus kind of thing. And then the rating information gets um, updated as well. So for this new explanation, when it gets shown to uh, uh, some learner, gets the rating information and the policy gets updated based on the Thompson sampling uh, technique. And then the policy gets upda updated with new ratings. And for a new learner using the statistical uh, uh, policy, it picks which explanation to show to the new uh, learner. And you might be wondering, why don't, why don't you just simply you know, pick the highly uh, highest rated explanation to the new learner? And the thing is that uh, for new explanations, they might not have an, might not have gotten enough opportunities um, to get enough ratings. So that's why we want to kind of balance uh, by giving more exposure to the new ones and also get the uh, useful evidence. And interestingly, what we found uh, from an experiment was that uh, in in our system. Um, accuracy increase when people are working uh, with various types of explanations. Having no explanation, as you can see from the rightmost um, bar, uh, had very little uh, increase in people's uh, uh, problem-solving accuracy. And when they were seeing instructor-generated explanations, they had about you know 9% increase. Uh, with access, it was 12%. So what this tells us is that there are cases where um, the system was able to distill explanations that are better than the version created by the instructor. So in this system, you are um, seeing how the AI um, you know, more actively gets involved in deciding you know, what gets shown to the next learner. And the human's goal uh, is to solve problems and they provide explanations and they rate explanations. So they provide all the necessary information that should be used by the system. And the AI you know, updates these policies um, using Thompson sampling. The interaction side, what happens is uh, as a result, uh, the better quality explanation kind of survives uh, with higher uh, 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 probability and it leads to better learning. So uh, there was a brief uh, sort of overview of uh, some of the projects uh, that I've been working on in the space of online education. And now I want to uh, switch gears to uh, cooking, a uh, slightly different domain. Uh, here we worked on this project called Recipescape, where we were interested in this idea of how these you know, recipe websites are almost like a naturally crowdsourced uh, a database of all these different approaches that people have. So let's say you want to learn about how to make chocolate chip cookies, you can easily find hundreds and thousands of similar but somewhat different uh, recipes that, that are about making chocolate chip cookies. So using cooking as, as a case study, we wanted to answer questions like, what makes a chocolate chip cookie a chocolate chip cookie? What is an average recipe, simplest, most complex? Or can we find you know, somewhat fundamentally different ways of making a cookie? So with these questions in mind, uh, we built this uh, you know, visual analytics kind of platform called uh, Recipescape. So what happens here is um, that I want to zoom into uh, this map on the top left here. This is called the recipe map, and each dot uh, represents a recipe. 
And as you can see, they are you know, clustered uh, by these colored uh, blocks. Based on the structure and the, the actual content of each uh, recipe, uh, the distance between two dots uh, represents the level of similarity. So here's an example uh, pair that are highly similar to each other. So they are very similar in terms of both the procedure and the actual steps uh, involving the actions and the ingredients. Um, on the other hand, these are looking very different and they're actually using uh, very different actions and, and ingredients. And it also shows the statistics and some trends of you know, temporal usage patterns of uh, top 10 ingredients and actions. So some obvious insights like you know, preheat always comes at the very beginning of most recipes. Um, but something like chocolate, um, there are these you know, uh, recipes that use them somewhat earlier in the, in the process. There are others that use later in the process and there are these cluster differences as well. And underneath this system, uh, um, what happens is that we do some you know, NLP and also represent uh, each recipe as a tree and you know, calculate the, the distance and doing the clustering to create the map. So that's sort of the uh, AI part that I don't wanna you know, get into too much detail about. But the point is that uh, with this kind of visual analytics uh, uh, dashboard, when we show these to uh, participants, our target participants were some professional people who want to do cooking analytics uh, for their professional needs, um, like professional chefs or culinary students. Uh, and here are some interesting results. So they were using this kind of uh, platform to do their own hypothesis testing and also using their, uh, testing their intuition against the actual data. So one person said, you know, recipes in this cluster probably do not use any eggs and probably involve baking in the later stages. Or these are the recipes for more crispy cookies. So they were, you know, trying to do sense making out of uh, analyzing these clusters. Um, so in this uh, project, uh, humans can browse and compare recipes uh, using this visual uh, dashboard. And the AI's role is to represent these recipes as trees, uh, and they compute similarity and cluster these recipes. And on the interaction side, um, it supports uh, humans' better sense making uh, as they can combine their intuition and data. And if you're interested in this uh, project, you can visit our project website, recipescape.kickslab.org. And here's some ongoing work. Um, so it was a published paper in 2018, and uh, we're currently collaborating with a Korean uh, food tech uh, startup uh, where they want to use this kind of uh, technique, um, but somewhat repurpose it to uh, do more uh, personalization. So let's say you have uh, diabetes, um, so you cannot just uh, follow a certain recipe uh, for your you know, uh, health reasons. And uh, we're using a similar kind of technique um, to recommend uh, ingredient and even action substitutions uh, based on some of the, the technical pipeline and also the, the visual uh, side of things that we worked on. So I think it's an exciting opportunity. All right, um, and quickly moving on to uh, the last project, um, now I want to uh, talk about chat and discussion here. So many groups are using um, chat-based medium to do their own decision making. So here, here is an example of how Comcast employees in the United States uh, have been using Slack to organize these protests about uh, opposing Muslim ban. Um, so there are you know, more and more of these groups using structured discussion to uh, decide uh, their collective action. But of course, this is a hard task. Uh, obviously, if you've you know, uh, been in those groups that are trying to make decisions using chat, uh, both as participants and moderators, there are these challenges. As participants, it's really hard to track what's going on and, and share your uh, ideas while listening to other people and tracking what has been decided. Uh, these things are difficult. Moderators go through even harder uh, experience. 
and you know they have to uh, have this very highly cognitive, um, really demanding tasks in managing the discussion because they need to draw people's attention, they need to summarize the ideas that came up, uh, they need to encourage consensus making, and they need to stimulate ideation and reasoning. So it's a lot of things that they have to do. So we thought, why don't we try to you know, help them uh, with our interactive system? So here's a system that we built called Solution Chat. So there are two main components. Uh, what you see on the left is what's called the agenda panel. So uh, while chat continuously you know, flows, uh, this agenda panel kind of stays here. So it's a more of a static component uh, that, that always shows the overall agenda and the main ideas that are contributed by the people. So by you know, having this kind of shared discussion agenda with the visualization of the current status and the major opinions, uh, it's meant to give better awareness of the progress of discussion. Um, and on the right, uh, it's, a, it's a chat interface, uh, the normal chat interface, but these blue blocks are the uh, message recommendations. So these are meant to help moderators uh, who are managing this discussion uh, with uh, real-time recommendations for moderation. Um, so if you used uh, Gmail's smart reply, you know, how it uh, recommends short responses like, you know, thank you, uh, you know, see you later, that sounds great kind of uh, replies. Uh, we are you know, inspired by this kind of uh, uh, approach, but in a more chat setting, uh, discussion moderation setting. Um, so it does some um, NLP to understand uh, the overall context of the discussion and intent of different utterances that people are making. And based on that, it um, provides real-time recommendations uh, for context-dependent uh, uh, moderation messages, like any more ideas or should we move to voting now? Uh, if someone has been quiet for a while, it says, I wonder what P0 thinks, can you tell us your opinion? So these types of uh, messages are shown in real time. And it's just a you know, click of a, of a block uh, for moderators to um, accept a uh, system recommended message. Or they can um, do also the, the inline kind of um, uh, response to someone's uh, opinion. And then uh, opinions could also be manually added uh, to the agenda panel on the left if the moderator thinks it's a, it's a worthy item to be listed as part of the main summary. Um, and in making this work, it's a mix of uh, you know, natural language processing, natural language understanding, AI, and also some heuristics, um, and also knowledge about uh, discussion um, education in terms of what it means to moderate these discussions. So we ran a, a controlled study uh, with 55 participants in 12 groups. Uh, and we had three conditions uh, with chat only and chat plus the agenda panel on the left and chat plus agenda panel plus the message recommendation. And we asked them to do some discussion with on-campus uh, topics. And just a summary of some major findings um, in terms of um, uh, moderation messages in when people were seeing the agenda panel it actually reduced the overall number of moderation messages that uh, people wrote uh, in their discussion probably because you know having this kind of summary uh, reduces the need for uh, having to manually write uh, 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 summarization messages um, but when it comes to having these uh, system recommendations, as you can see from the blue part in the, in the bottom uh, bar, um, it significantly increased uh, people's selection of these recommendations. Um, and our understanding is that because these are just simple clicks, people were not really hesitant to uh, uh, click them. And overall, about 10.5 uh, accepted messages um, were there per session, uh, and each session was uh, 20 minutes each. And we were seeing that um, there were yeah, fewer summarization messages when there was uh, the agenda panel on the left, and at the same time, uh, people reported uh, better trackability of the discussion when they were having uh, this kind of agenda panel and uh, message recommendation. 
So in this system, uh, the human manages chat discussion, the AI tries to understand the chat context and recommend uh, relevant moderation messages. Uh, and as a result, uh, more efficient facilitation happens while humans uh, still keep uh, the control. So in our ongoing work, we are um, now actually doing a live deployment with over 2000 employees in a corporate education setting. Um, and yeah, yesterday, actually, we ran another session with 300 people uh, in 60 different rooms. So we were thinking uh, of using this kind of system to do more of the remote, uh, but uh, highly discussion based uh, learning. Um, and we're also exploring different kind of user and agent uh, models. In terms of uh, maybe can we expand this to provide more participant uh, support or group level feedback. Okay, so uh, I told you about these uh, three projects in a in a very fast manner. So um, sorry, I couldn't you know get into more details, and maybe some of the details were hard to to parse. But hopefully, you still got the high level idea of how we were using some of the AI technology uh, to help uh, with people in their learning, analytics, and discussion settings. But you might also be wondering, why not just fully automate all these? Automate summary generation, cookie analysis, and discussion moderation. Um, maybe it could be fancier, um, better sell, but here, here is our thought process. We also thought about potentially fully automating it, but then we thought, why do we even need to do that? People actually want that. And by carefully understanding the user needs and understanding the context, we realized that there could be reasons for not fully automating it. And then came to uh, the concrete steps of how not to fully automate it by determining the right sort of uh, uh, level of uh, AI in this problem domain. And in the end, it was about how to better support uh, human AI interaction and collaboration. So that was our thought process. And uh, here's my uh, sort of lessons slide. Um, that you know, full automation. Like, uh, ben has raised his hand. Maybe oh, for oh. a big question. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Please finish. Please finish. Oh yeah. So this is uh, second to my last slide. So yeah, if you give me one more minute, I'll be I'll be done. Awesome. Yeah, so um, our you know, uh, lessons uh, were that full automation is often not the, not the answer and, and using Ben's uh, 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 framework of human control and automation, uh, achieving high level in both is quite challenging. And I think we, as a community, we need better sort of uh, design patterns and, and guidelines and so on, but I think it's possible. Um, and UX of AI is important and should be considered and we need to adapt AI to people in teams, not the other way around. And I think, uh, here's an analogy. This is a Korean style uh, sushi called uh, kimbap. Um, and with AI, it's like, uh, we have this new, you know, innovative way of you know, making ham, uh, one of the ingredients, uh, uh, much better. Uh, could be much more tasty, much cheaper to uh, produce. But then we need to consider all these other things in order for this product uh, to be highly effective, right? So all these components should be considered together in order for the, the holistic experience to make sense. And in that sense, I would argue that human AI interaction should be a first class object in our design. And that as a society, we need to train uh, our people to work with AI better. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk, um, Juho. Um, I think Ben's question would be a great segue for the Q&A session. And after that, uh, we can take Krishna's question. And I believe we're gonna have uh, maybe total two or three uh, questions uh, amount of time. And um, at exactly one, I think people are gonna uh, go to the extras for the next meeting. Uh, as I do as well. So uh, I wonder, Juho, uh, do you plan to stay here uh, for a little longer in this room to take a little more question than networking for maybe? Sure, yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to you know, stay and chat with people if, if there are people who want to. Awesome, so I'm gonna uh, leave it to you and then let's start the Q&A session from now on. Hi, Ben, go ahead. 
Thank you. Appreciate your talk. It was uh, well done and good lessons, which I support. Your three examples show a appropriate design strategies for getting the best of both. Um, I have uh, two uh, questions about two things that you might add or features that would be part of it. Maybe they are part of it. Is First, is, is there a control panel for the human user to operate uh, the AI and set parameters or variables to it? And secondly, is there a strategy for retrospective analysis by which uh, the history of what the AI system did could be uh, reviewed and then tuned to make it even more successful? Thank yeah, you. thank you for the great suggestion. So you were asking uh, if there's a control panel where the user could sort of you know, change the uh, parameters and operations of how the AI works. So in the, uh, I guess different systems have somewhat different flavors, but um, so that's something we have not directly added to many of the uh, systems yet. <laughs> Although we have been uh, doing more on the admin side uh, and that's something we want to uh, expose more to the user side. So, I mean, that's something we definitely want to uh, consider further. And retrospective analysis in um, in the in the solution chat, the discussion uh, stuff. Uh, yeah, we do um, keep track of you know what what options have been selected by the user so that they can uh, you know, track if they accepted the system recommendation and so on. Um, but I think this uh, overall sort of design idea could be further expanded to other types of systems, um, even in, in our other systems as well. And, and these are yeah, fantastic suggestions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think those are both important possibilities. I'm glad you're exploring them. Thank you again. Thank you. Christina? Yes, hi. Um, thanks for the excellent talk. My name is Christina Conati. I'm a faculty member. I am in the AI group, but my work is uh, uh, exactly at the intersection of AI and HCI with AI-driven personalization. So I found your talk really exciting and your examples as well. Thanks again. Thank I had a, a question specific to one of the projects that you presented and then a higher level comment. Um, so my question was um, about the access system that you presented on um, generating explanations for uh, problems. Um, I was wondering in your evaluation, you compared access against expert generated explanations. Um, but <clears throat> in access, users were doing a variety of things, right? Looking at explanations, rating them, generating self explanations, which is a well known way to foster learning. I was wondering if they were doing something similar in the expert version or they were just reading the explanations of the experts because that could be a bit of a confound, right? Because in what, in, with AXIS, they are engaged in very interesting proactive learning activities, where, whereas in the other one, maybe if they're just reading the explanations, then it's a, it's a different kind of uh, engagement, right? Right, so let me quickly answer that question first. Um, so in, in this slide, the, uh, the evaluation was done in a separate setting. Uh, so these uh, people who were just seeing the explanations uh, were not using access as a system. They were just presented the access generated explanation. Um, so we wanted to make the, the comparison fair in that we wanted to just look at the quality of explanations that are access generated, instructor generated, and no explanation. So the, the graph you're seeing here is in our you know, separate stage ex uh, uh, experiment uh, where people were just uh, evaluated by working with seeing the uh, explanations. Okay. And you're right in that the actual system involves uh, more of these uh, uh, you know, uh, cognitive uh, processes like self-explanation and you know, seeing the explanation and so on. So I think we need uh, a more holistic kind of understanding of that package together. Is that likely to yield even better learning outcome or not? And I think that's an open question and we, we have not addressed that in particular yet. Yeah. <clears throat> and just a quick comment, um, something that I'm really interested in and the AI community and HCI as well is this concept of explainability of uh, the AI techniques. And, and I think that's key in having that idea of having the AI and the humans to become more like a, a collaborative uh, endeavor. And so getting the AI techniques to be a little bit more um, understandable and um, 
interpretable is something that is uh, it's key in, in moving in the right direction. Uh, and I was wondering if you have any, if you've done any work on that, if you have any thoughts that you want to share. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, explainability is such an important and and also somewhat uh, a topic that that uh, leads to different interpretations uh, to people in different communities. I find um, when I talk to people in AI uh, about explainability, they you know tend to think of models that can automatically generate explanations. Uh, when we talk to people in HCI, it's about uh, help people actually understand the explain explanation of AI or having a better mental model of how AI works. So uh, I have not directly worked on projects that are you know about explainability in uh, in, in specific um, but in all these projects we've been encountering um, cases where users were trying to uh, interpret how the AI works and we try to uh, explain them through our UI. So for instance, in solution chat, the discussion support system, we were trying to give reasons for why a particular message is uh, recommended um, to, to serve as an explanation, basically. Um, and then in the, the recipe map uh, view, uh, we explain to people what, what, how to interpret these uh, maps so that they could uh, understand why, why these dots are you know, far apart from each other and so on. Um, so that was more on the, the UI side, and I think uh, the AI community has been thinking about these uh, more, I don't know, like scalable techniques for automatically generating uh, explanations that are more tied to how the model and uh, actually works. So I think uh, these techniques combined, I think there could be more uh, impactful approaches for improving uh, explainability. But I think these two communities, unfortunately, are still quite far apart. Uh, so more conversation and collaboration, I, I think, is needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think this is the uh, time that we should put an official closure to the awesome uh, talk and Q&A. Thank you so much for Juho again. And then I believe uh, people will move on to the next meeting if they have to. I want to remind uh, people that we're going to keep the room open. And then Juho will be here for the next 10 to 15 minutes uh, in the networking with you and answering your questions. I want to remind Juho that there is an excellent question by uh, Professor Lisa Hosty regarding the potential negative impact of um, you know, uh, giving cognitive assistance uh, based on AI uh, feature. Um, so I believe that that's going to be a great segue for the other in interesting uh, discussion session. Thank you so much and see you next time.